Hey, Mr. Chairperson, you're good to go now. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the March 30th, um, 2023 EMS uh, Land Ambulance Meeting. And uh, we have some new people on uh, the committee. And I think we'll, uh, I'm Jamie McGarvey, uh, Mayor of the Town of Perry Sound and Chair of the, the EMS Committee. And we have also have uh, Matt Thomas with us tonight too, uh, manager of uh, the EMS. So I guess Matt, we'll start with you. If you can introduce yourself, we'll. Certainly, yeah, uh, thank, thank you. So as uh, Jimmy mentioned, my name is Matt Thomas. I'm the manager of Perry Sound District EMS. Um, I live in the village of South River, uh, work out of South River, and uh, I manage the day-to-day -day operations of, uh, of the ambulance service. Uh, Joel? Yeah, I'm Joel Constable with the uh, Township of McDougal, and um, I do have some experience with um, social services, which in other areas ties into this, but also with uh, volunteer fire as well. And, uh, so good to be here and be interesting to see how things go. Good. good. Scott? Hi, I'll unmute myself. Hi, I'm Scott Sheard. Uh, some of you I know, it's a pleasure to meet those I don't. I'm uh, with the Township of the Archipelago, and I represent an offshore ward, which is well known to EMS uh, in terms of concentration of people. So uh, this will be my second term, I guess, uh, in uh, serving on the EMS committee and look forward to the, ne the next few years with all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Pearl? Hi there, I'm Pearl Ivins. I'm a newly appointed councillor for a Township of Macker, and I also represent uh, South River, Strong, Sundridge, and Jolly as well. John? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Wilson. I'm a uh, councillor and deputy mayor for the village of Brooks Falls. Um, I represent Town of Kearney, Township of Perry, Township of McMurrick Monteith, Township of Ryerson, Township of Armour. Village of Berks Falls and the municipality of Magnetowan. Um, I have uh, recently completed uh, 34 years of volunteer service on our local fire department as a communications officer. And interestingly enough, um, Perry Sound District EMS is dispatched out of two different dispatch services. I worked for Perry Sound ACS for 11 years. Uh, the last few as a supervisor so i have a little bit of background on this this project so i'm looking forward to learning some more nice to meet you all good good and <clears throat> thanks very much good evening everybody this is my second term on the ems and uh, i value the services so much i'm delighted to be involved and learn more and see how we can help i'm the mayor of seguin sherry Yep, you're muted, Sherry. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I work for the town of Perry Sound, more specifically the Perry Sound Fire Department. And I've been there for about 18 years. And I think I've worked for Dave for about 10 of those years. So it's nice to see everybody finally. Dave? Good evening, everyone. I'm Dave Thompson, I'm the Director of um, Development and Protective Services for the Town of Perry Sound. So I'm your staff liaison rep with the town. All right. <clears throat> so we'll get on with the meeting here. And uh, may I have a mover and seconder for the agenda? Uh, Joel and Scott. Oh. Anne's back, okay. Um, at the March 30th, 2023 Perry Sound District Emergency Medical Services Committee meeting agenda be approved. All in favor? That's yeah, carried. Any disclosure pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? No? 
OK, that's good. <clears throat> May I have a mover and seconder for the minutes? Anne and Joel. OK, that the minutes of the October 27th, 2022 meeting the Perry Sound uh, District Emergency Medical Services Committee be approved and circulated. Was there any discussion or comments uh, on those minutes? No? OK. Uh, all in favor then? OK, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, correspondence. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Chairperson, there was, uh, we don't usually get correspondence that comes to the committee. However, there was a note that was sent to us from um, Orange with regards to the Christmas snow conditions and the, um, uh, just a, a note of thanks to Perry Sound District EMS with regards to a particular call that Orange was involved in. Um, Matt may just, you know, summarize that for you in a second. However, I would li also like to note that uh, this was a, a note received from Orange, but we also recognize that throughout that week before and during Christmas, all the municipalities stepped up immensely with helping EMS get to sites, access patients, and all sorts of uh, other issues that came up. But Matt, maybe um, you just want to summarize that uh, particular <coughs> incident that Orange was involved in? Uh, sure, absolutely. So uh, yeah, this call in particular occurred um, Christmas Eve, I believe it was. Uh, if you recall, there was uh, pretty horrendous snowstorms throughout our district, um, and there's a significant uh, car accident involving two two young people that were transported to Westbury Sound Health Center. Uh, it was determined it was in their best interest that they needed a higher level of care than provided uh, provided locally. Um, due to the weather, Orange was unable to fly. Uh, so, through collaboration with the town of Perry Sound, uh, OPP, uh, plow <laughs> operators, just a, a huge number of people, um, we were able to have a, a paramedic from Orange drive down from Sudbury to Perry Sound. We had a crew from Orange uh, come up from Toronto via land ambulance, uh, partnered up with our crews and utilizing uh, resources on the highway. They were able to clear the highway and a path for these, these young people to be transported down to, to Toronto for, uh, for care. Um, both survived, both are home, both are doing well. Uh, and just one of those really great feel good stories that um, you know, lots and lots of people had an had a amazing hand in. That's really good that everything turned out okay, you know, considering what happened. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add, Dave, or are we good? Uh, no, I, I'm good. It's just it was okay. uh, the whole week was a collaboration of everyone in the entire district. And it, as Matt said, it, it was a feel good situation. I heard many stories from many municipalities about their public works team getting out and helping out, their fire departments getting out and helping out, and um, everyone pulling together. So uh, teamwork. it was fantastic teamwork. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, next is up is your report, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. So uh, section five is the director's report. Um, <clears throat> For the new members in this section, I tried to give everyone just a um, an overview of the the bigger issues that are going on. They're um, you know generally similar meeting to meeting as you move through, and some will fall off and others will start. But um, with regards to this particular director's report, I have some information with regards to the EMS bases. Last year, we did do a fairly extensive uh, capital repair program with them. Uh, due to mostly contractor shortages, but also some equipment shortages, we weren't able to get that entire program done. So there is some carryover into this year. It was mostly focused on the um, Perry Sound, South River and Powassan bases. Uh, so there will still be some more work going on there. The other issue of note and an update for the committee was um, the previous committee had um, provided direction to staff and town council had uh, approved it to start discussions with the uh, village of Berks Falls with regards to uh, a joint EMS fire base. So the village of Berks Falls along with uh, Ryerson and another municipality, I'm sorry, John. Council of Armour. Armour. Um, jointly run a fire department. They are looking at putting in a new uh, fire hall 
our base in Berks Falls is severely substandard. I would suggest it's uh, it's very dated. It's not very large. There are a number of issues with that particular base. Our uh, previous committee and town council had provided uh, direction to staff to start working with those communities in terms of seeing if a joint program can be uh, initiated and move forward. That is still ongoing. Um, you'll note in the financial report that we want to lease all the bases. And so we have had partnerships in the past with, and still do with um, uh, the archipelago as well as Seguin on leasing bases from them and having those communities uh, do the construction of bases. And then we lease back from them over a period of years. So this would be a very similar program if we uh, can get it to, to come together. So you will be hearing, this will happen within your term on the committee, and you will be hearing more about this. It would be one of the most, uh, you know, a very significant initiative if we were to move forward with this uh, within the next four years. Any questions with regards to the EMS bases or orientation anyone needs? Any, please feel free to ask questions uh, as I'm going through the director's report if you want further clarification. The financial position in 2022 was strong. Um, the West Prairie Sound Health Center has uh, forecasted a um, surplus, modest surplus. We do not have audited statements yet. Those will be coming forward to the next meeting that we have. Uh, however, we are in a good position with our 2022 financial um, finances. Land ambulance operators contract. Uh, if some of you are unaware, the way that we provide the service is through a contract with the West Perry Sound Health Center. So the West Perry Sound Health Center is Matt's employer, as well as all the rest of the medics are employed by the West Perry Sound Health Center. And we have a contract with them for them to provide that service. They have been providing that service since uh, Perry Sound District EMS um, consolidated all of its various contracts that would have been around uh, 2003, I believe. We've had this arrangement with West Prairie Sound Health Center. Uh, the last committee provided uh, staff with direction through the town of Perry Sound to carry on further contract talks with the West Perry Sound Health Center for uh, extending that contract. Uh, we are in the process of that. And again, that will be coming forward uh, probably within the next uh, next couple of meetings that we have as a group. So there is progress being made there. We have some good news with regards to long distance transfers. This has been a long going concern and issue for uh, the municipalities. Uh, the West Prairie Sound Health Center has recently implemented a transfer service, which has made a significant um, decrease in the number of long distance and actually local transfers that the ambulance service has been performing. So I'll speak to this again when we get to the statistics because it's it's clearly identifiable, the difference that's been made in a six month period. Um, this is a, a, a positive thing and it uh, frees up the land ambulance resources to do what they're supposed to do, which is respond to emergencies. And the last item I have here is just an orientation on one of the initiatives that we'll be performing this year. It's in the budget. It's a unit hour utilization. This is a third party contract that we re release. The purpose of a unit hour utilization is to determine whether the deployment of the ambulances is appropriate, uh, as well as whether we need to, uh, where we would need to consider about expanding services into the future. So, what a unit hour utilization does is it assesses how active an ambulance is. And the industry standard is that it, to maximize finances, an ambulance should be utilized 40% of the time. If it's utilized for more than 40% of the time, you start running a risk of uh, missing or not being available when there are emergencies. If it is utilized less than 40% of the time, uh, it would be considered underutilized. Sorry, I'm just gonna wait for a second here and then dropped off and I'm just bringing her back in. 
Yeah, sorry. That's gotcha. That's good. I don't I don't know what happened. You the, you all froze, you all froze and then I, then I my screen went black. My apologies. Connectivity is great when it works. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> so deployment in Perry Sound District is generally based upon geography rather than um, maximizing utilization. The ambulances, you know, have to travel at significant distances and we therefore need to have them spaced out. So call volumes are increasing. You can see that through some of the statistics. We'll talk about that as well. And as those call volumes increase, then there are some stations that start reaching those, uh, that 40% maximum that we don't really want to start crossing. When we hit those maximums, we need to start thinking about deployment of additional resources. So we haven't, we usually do a unit hour utilization every two or three years to just confirm what we generally know is going on. Uh, Matt is, has his thumb on the pulse all the time and um, has a general idea of uh, what the utilization is. However, we have a third party do it. They do a full assessment and we haven't done in the past couple of years because quite frankly, COVID threw a complete wrench in the whole system. It threw all our statistics off. You can take a look at the month of uh, April, 2020 as an example of where call volumes were almost nil. And uh, that was just because everyone was sitting in their house, and no one was going out and getting injured. Yeah. So it hasn't been really until 2022 where we had a year of solid statistics to be able to do a full assessment of. So that will be occurring this year. And we'll be bringing that forward to yourselves with the uh, any recommendations that the third party contractor is making with regards to where we should be considering deployment in the future. Okay. Anything else? That's it for the okay. uh, the director's report. So I got a couple of questions. Um, the Powassan base is the only base that we own, right? That's correct. The Boston base is owned by the uh, yeah. by the town on behalf of the district. Yeah. So have we thought about divesting ourselves of that and leasing space? Because we don't get, if I understand this, if we lease, we get half that money from the province or whatever to cover it. But if we own, we don't. Right? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chairperson, the that is correct. We want to lease when we're spending money. The issue with Boston is that it's it's bought and paid for now, and yeah. it has been fully depreciated. So, if we were to divest of it, it would be a cash infusion. But then we would have to make an expenditure to place the staff in another location. Right. So, I uh, I have discussed this with the financial officer here in the town, and there wouldn't be advantages to. No. Doing that, the base is in good shape and it serves a, uh, a very suitable uh, purpose and it is well placed as well. Okay. Um, if through the unit hour utilization, the consultant comes back and says, you know, you guys should consider moving to calendar or something of that nature. I mean, we could consider it at that point. But the last time we did a uh, location analysis, uh, Powassan was very well positioned to maximize its responses to the areas around it. Okay. All right. I just wanted to double check and, and see, you know, if there'd been any <clears throat> thought around that. Um, the other one was, is I see there are th looks like three retired ambulances up at the transfer station area, the public works yard. Have we had any thoughts around what we're going to do with those? If there's other municipalities that are interested in utilizing them or, um, for selling them off? Uh, Through you, Mr. Chairperson, I have actually disposed of those. Uh, today oh. was the closing for those ambulances. Okay. In the past, there had been a demand from municipalities to um, access those units, but that demand has diminished significantly in the past five years. I would say there's only about one or two municipalities anymore that have a desire for those um, those old used ambulances to utilize as first response vehicles. Um, one being um, Whitestone usually likes to have one and, and sometimes um, 
Brit wants to get involved in that. Uh, however, they're both satisfied with what they have right now. So we disposed of those, or we are in the process of disposing of those. It just closed today. And, um, and I was advised that uh, they actually brought a, a fairly good, uh, fairly good dollar. So that money will go back into the EMS service for uh, future capital purchase. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Dave? No? Okay. May I have a mover and seconder for to accept the report? Uh, John and Scott. And that the emergency service director's report dated March 30th, 2023 be accepted as submitted. All in favor. And that's carried. Thank you. Reports, Dave. Mr. Chairperson, I want to bring the committee's attention to, there's two things here. You, you may have questions about the all the statistical reports. I'm sure, especially for the new members, that um, the, it's an overwhelming amount of information, so don't hesitate to, uh, to inquire what some of these means. But initially, uh, on the first page, that would be uh, page seven of your agenda, there in the first column, uh, in the first section, there is a just below code nine is long distance transfers. If we follow that line all the way across to the right, you will see the 2021. So this is a full year. This was what I provided you was December. There was no point in providing you with uh, February's because it's such a small sample size. I want to provide you with a full year. So this is December 2022. And the impact of the hospital having a transfer service is clearly shown here. In 2021, there were 355 long distance transfers. So a long distance transfer would be considered out of our district. So that's one per day where we had an ambulance going out of the district to move a patient for various reasons, um, one time a day. So um, I would suggest that would be a minimum of four hours the ambulance was gone for, sometimes as long as eight or 10. I see Matt nodding his head as that would be a correct assessment. So in the six months of the West Prairie Sound Health Center having a transfer service, um, so they only started that transfer service in the summer of 2022. The total for all of 2022 had been reduced to 241 transfers. This is a fairly impactful situation for us because it now frees up the uh, ambulances to do what they're supposed to. And that should be reflected in our unit hour utilization report. Um, so this is very positive. And the hospital did a lot of, um, they got into a situation where we were just having to decline so many of their long distance transfers that it was impacting their processes and their systems. And it was um, uh, quite justifiable to move into having a transfer service do it. The transfer service also does local uh, transfers. And uh, although local transfers don't take up nearly as much time, they do still have an impact on the service. And um, so there's a number of local transfers that are being conducted by the, uh, the transfer service now instead of EMS doing them. So that is a positive um, occurrence. And we should see a positive trend there in 2023 with a full year of having the transfer service in place. The other item I would like to draw to your attention is the chart that would be on page 12, 12 of the agenda. And this simply identifies our trends. And we only have five years on here, but I can tell you if we had 10 years on here, it would be the exact same thing. Every year we are increasing in calls, some years in calls as much as 10%. And, um, you know, that why it can be debated. Is it because people are more willing to call 911? Is it the older population we have? Are people um, having more risky lifestyles where they're having a need for EMS more so? That can all be debated, but what can't is the numbers. And this increase just clearly defines why we always have to be aware of the utilization of the ambulances and when we have to 
start considering increasing service levels. Um, if there's any other questions with regards to the numbers, Matt and I would be happy to uh, to answer some of those if, if people uh, have anything. Yeah. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I think um, a lot of the um, increase in calls too is because of the hospitals are so overwhelmed that it's much better to call an ambulance and have them take right. you to the hospital. You're gonna get looked at much faster than if you go into emerge and sit there for hours. So I, I know that's a, a big uh, big thing up here as well too. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what callbacks mean. What are callbacks? Does that mean that somebody goes calls the ambulance twice? Uh, through you, Ms. Chairperson, uh, no. So we have two shifts that have an on-call component to them. One in Argyle and also one in Perry Sound. And so a callback in that sense is when the, um, the shift is off duty and they get called back in to perform a, uh, an emergency run. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, so somebody's off duty and they get called back in to do something? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I thought it was the patient calling back. Well, some probably do. <laughs> <laughs> so to that, to that point, um, and, and patients do call back and, and Matt can probably speak to that. But one of our programs is the Community Paramedicine Program. And Matt's team does a good job of assessing what we would call people who utilize the service over and over again, because it's a very good indicator that someone has having some quality of life issues and, and needs some better attention from the healthcare system. And uh, it's very hard to quantify the <clears throat> impact of the community, uh, community paramedicine program on that particular area. But we know that we do have an impact and we are able to um, address those individuals before they call 911. Matt, do you want to speak about that for a second? Uh, certainly. Yeah. So uh, and as part of our community paramedicine program, we um, we have about 900 or so active clients on our, our CP roster. Um, some of them require very little, uh, little of our attention. So it could be as much as a, as little as a phone call a, a month, just checking in to see if there's been any change in their health status. Or it could be like Director Thompson said, uh, somebody who is a, a very frequent or heavy 911 user, uh, in which case we'll, we'll work with both the patients, um, their primary care practitioner, and other care providers to come up with a, a plan that, that works for the patient, that works for the healthcare system to uh, hopefully reduce the amount of 911 usage that they, that they have. And this, actually, we, we had a, a client recently who uh, used our system, I believe it was nine, uh, 21 times in 10 days. Um, so in, in working with their um, their care team, um, we've been able to reduce that dramatically. So that's it's it's been nice to have that collaboration. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad the government too decided to keep some money in the paramedicine program too. So that's a uh, that's a bonus. We're still waiting on some permanent funding for that. So our, oh, our fingers are crossed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think it's enough that they're giving, but it's it's good at least that they're getting some. Um, John. The funding that has, I think, recently been announced for, for continuation of the, the, the uh, community paramedicine on, a, I guess, a pilot basis, is that similar to the funding that was received in previous years? Like, does that continue the, the service level that we have currently in place without uh, municipal dollars going into it? Like, is it... If, if the funding was adequate for what we have had in 2022, is that same level of funding still available for 2023? Through you, Mr. Chairperson, we have primarily two sources of funding for community paramedicine. One is through the LIN, and this has been um, non-indexed for about five years now. We've been receiving about a quarter, well, 214,600, I believe is the exact number. $214,600. Uh, that's one avenue. We also have the, the bigger pot is a $900,000 per year for three years that 
2023 is the last year of that. Now, sometime this year, the <laughs> province is going to have to decide how are they moving forward. Um, that $900,000, we were, not all the services get that. And uh, we put together a business case uh, in conjunction with EMS, the hospital, and the town. And we submitted it and we were successful in our application. About, um, it was probably about six months ago, six months ago, we did have an inquiry in terms of if we were to, you know, expand the program, what would it look like and how would we do it? And so we did provide a budget summary to them of how we could expand the program moving forward and how the province is going to handle the expiring of the program in March of 2024. We are unsure of at this point. Um, it's a good program, but what it is is a program that affects the healthcare system overall. And this is why they're funding it 100%. It's not really a municipal responsibility. Um, it's utilization of the medics in non-traditional fashion that can have a, you know, when the medics are positioned in a very uh, properly to impact the patient. Um, and the impacts on the system are being assessed. So. How that's going to move forward, we don't know yet. We are very interested because, you know, we have to start making some decisions at the end of the year if the funding is not going to carry on about what our service looks like after that. And um, if it is going to carry on, the, the province has to decide, you know, what's it going to look like moving forward. Any other questions? No? Okay. Can I have a mover and seconder for the reports? Joel and Anne. Uh, that the EMS committee members receive reports 61, 62, and 63 as listed above. All in favor? And that's carried. Good. All right, we're into other business, EMS advisory committee terms of reference and schedule. AD 2023, 20, Dave? So this report is information for the committee members with regards to the terms of reference. Those have been circulated to all the municipalities when appointments are made this year. We did struggle slightly with appointments for this term. We have ironed it out now as you're all with us. Um, however, town council decided that due to those struggles that were impacting us being able to bring the committee together that they wanted to make a couple of amendments and what had previously been in place was that um, appointments had to be by consensus of the municipalities. We struggled with that this year and gaining consensus in, in two, um, two areas for their, for their members to be nominated and uh, so we did change that in the terms of reference that it now um, is recommending consensus but if there is a lack of consensus, then a majority position could be taken by the municipalities. So it's quite a very minor, subtle change. Um, however, the rest of the terms of reference were um, generally not changed, uh, just slightly updated. And uh, those are for your, your information about what the committee is about and, and what we do. What I'm also asking with regards to this report is to set our schedule for the next four years. So I'm making the suggestion, which we have used in the past, which seems to work for most municipalities, is the fourth Thursdays, fourth Thursday of the months, February, May, and October as our standard meetings. If there is a need for meetings outside of that, they would be at the call of the chair and we would, we would schedule that, but these would be standard meetings that we would have to provide updates. The October meeting is relatively important because that's when we address budget each year. So um, that would be my request of the committee to um, uh, approve that. And uh, then we know exactly when we're going to be getting together. Okay. Any questions or comments on, on that? No? Scott? Yeah, just uh, something unrelated. Uh, I had informed Dave that in the wisdom of our council, that should any council member get hit by a bus or become a client of EMS, that we'd have a, 
an alternate, um, uh, certainly not to uh, to participate in meetings, but in every chair position and as well as EMS advisory. So I have uh, the esteemed uh, Councillor McLeod, who uh, I'm just going to have shadow as a guest occasionally in case something happened to me. So I don't think the terms of reference really uh, uh, would address that, but it might be a food for thought that um, possibly other municipalities have that system of um, alternate Our chairs and, uh, in their appointments to committees and uh, so forth. So I'll throw it open for discussion. I've left everybody stunned. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, 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 let, let me come back next time and we can talk more about it after we've had time to look at the terms yeah. of reference. But uh, as it stands, certainly comfortable with it. Okay. John? You know, I think that's probably a, a wise idea, even if, if someone were to be not available for meeting. Zoom is a great platform, but um, uh, what I'll do, uh, what I think would be a great idea for me is to contact the municipalities that I represent and say, hey, what do you think about this and get a consensus of, of our group and then see if I can um push forward perhaps with with getting someone from one of those member municipalities that might be interested should we decide to go forward with this as a as a as a go forward i mean would, would that perhaps be something that might be planned for the the may meeting if if that's if we stay on the, on the same sequence would we have some discussion perhaps in may whether or not that would be a good policy for us to adopt to have an alternate so i'm going to run this by Dave. So um, council would have to approve that um, concept. Um, so it's not a bad idea. And if we can think about it, um, if, if we can we postpone voting on this one? and then bring it back to the next meeting then after discussion and then recommend to to council to have that what do you think dave uh through, through you uh mr chairperson so we've tied this into the resolution that i have in front of you so they really aren't the same thing so if we could still no. deal with the resolution here with regards to the um the concept the terms of reference as they currently stand don't contemplate um having a alternate who could participate right so there would be absolutely no reason there couldn't be an alternate who observed or um right. uh, you know paid attention so that they knew the issues the, by all means i'm more of that that could happen the better as far as i'm concerned throughout the uh, uh the the district uh, if we were contemplating having a alternate that could actually participate in the absence of a nominated and approved member that would require a change to the terms of reference i think i would want yeah. to confirm that with our clerk's department yeah. um so i think there's there's two levels that the committee could move towards for those of you who would be interested in having alternates i don't see any reason why you couldn't have that prepared and that person could ob observe and if someone was hit by a bus which i hope <laughs> not, that's not happened um, then obviously they could be nominated to that position relatively quickly. Or the alternate would be requesting the town of Perry Sound to make changes to the terms of reference so that there were actual appointed alternates that could participate in the absence of a committee member. Okay. Yeah, Scott. Uh, through the chair, I would just offer Dave that, um, I think our councils are has voted on that because that's our system of uh, backing up that uh, so there'd be an informed person uh, heaven forbid the uh, the bus got too close so uh so i think so the uh the town would have that uh, or the other municipalities would come to the town with that that uh, certification um and i i think in principle we just have to decide whether that's a legislative thing we want to do um, I think it makes a lot of sense myself, but in terms of the practical side of it, I think uh, Dave's hit it on the nail. 
we can have them as an advert, uh, uh, observer anyway, so they would never be uh, coming in cold um, to committee uh, should uh, something happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I can suggest, uh, Mr. Chairperson, yeah. I could um, I could consult with the town clerk find out you know what options were available and I could present those back to the committee in May for the next meeting uh, for you know a recommendation at that time if that would be suitable to the committee. Is that good with everybody? Okay. Are we good passing what we have here tonight? Right? Just pass this as it is tonight, Dave. Through you, Mr. Chairperson, that's why I'm asking, just so we know what the schedule is. And then, you know, Sherry can take notes that I've been provided direction to consult with the clerk about uh, okay. opportunities for for alternates for committee members. Okay. Uh, John? Um, I'm wondering if, I mean, one of the challenges with, with my seat on this committee, as well as a couple of others, uh, is that we represent, I mean, I have, I think, six municipalities I represent which for like the archipelago, uh, archipelago, you know, single municipality because of its size, see the same thing. Um, you know, it's a simple discussion and a simple decision for them. Um, I'm not, you know, I thought it was a great idea, but, you know, logistically um, the same problem may arise for an alternate as arose in mean, my seat is one of the, the challenging ones where there was no consensus, no clear consensus among a large number of municipalities. So the, the concept is great, but I'm wondering logistically if that for like my area, for example, is going to be a bit of a nightmare to try and manage. Unless from the outset there was like two appointed members, you know, one being a primary and one being a secondary, then, you know, still to be a voting member is difficult if you don't sit in every meeting. I don't really think we want to expand the municipal portion of this committee by by two, like by twice what it is currently. So um I thought it was a great idea, but maybe Dave, if you if you would, in consultation with your with your clerk, perhaps bring up the the challenges of a large number appointing one, as in in my area's case, and see if that presents any logistical challenges from their perspective, because it may. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, I just want to agree with John on that. That sounds like a real nightmare, and as much as I feel that, you know, the work that's being done here is very important. It is advisory only. And so if any of us do step in front of the bus, I don't see, I think, I don't see the big deal in this being able to carry on while the municipalities, so say my member municipalities come together and find a new person, especially now that you've changed things so that we're dealing with um, majority instead of consensus. I don't think we're going to run into the same problems. So I know for me, I think this would probably cause more problems than not. Um, whereas when you have um, some of the other municipalities that are re representing themselves, it's an easy win. Um, even with DSAB, I know I don't have an alternate and um, it's the same thing. Um, so anyways, I, I agree with John. Well, Mr. Mayor or yeah. chairperson, um, Nothing inhibits the Township of the Archipelago who appears to want to have someone prepped just in case to have that person. That person can um, observe the YouTube, uh, pay attention, keep up, and all of those things. And if something were to happen to their primary representative, it would be an easy thing for them to make a, a nomination to have that person step right in. So... By not doing it, it doesn't hinder the municipality of the archipelago, township of the archipelago. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of seeing people think that it's not necessary to have uh, alternate appointments uh, for everyone. Okay. All right. Well, then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through with the resolution that we have for tonight. If anyone sees anything any different that they want to bring it back at the next meeting that's 
fine. I I think it's worth a conversation maybe with I, I mean for for Anne and um Scott it's easy, you know. Um but for the others it's a little more challenging. So but I, I think we're probably good right now then. From what I'm hearing, uh we're we're good the way we are. Yeah. John? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, the through the uh, the terms of reference, I mean, I'll, I'm on page four of the terms of reference, which I'm assuming is part of the, it's all part of the, the package that we're currently um, reviewing. Um, under section eight, uh, 8.1.2, establishment of district oversight committee to manage and control the service, uh, because I have no idea how this committee runs and, and, and the, the practical um role that it plays is that is that a thing because you know the the step in um the the secondary representative for an area if that if that plan actually that committee the oversight committee actually exists and a member that is unable to attend or part of that oversight committee that might have a, a more impactful um it might be more impactful on the the that committee if that person were not available so does that exist the district oversight committee or is that just there if it's needed to be established hey okay. uh three minutes to turn a person that is that does not exist as the way it is this committee would be acting as an oversight committee um so it has it was there in case there was a need envisioned at the initial time when the terms of reference were established and it's never been utilized Thank you. Yeah. Looking back here to my resolution. Any uh, any further comments, discussion on this? No. I need a mover and seconder. Scott and uh, John that the EMS advisory committee receives the terms of reference for information purposes, and that the committee sets a meeting schedule for 2023 to 2026 as the fourth Thursday of the month, February, May, October of each year at the call or at the call of the chair. All in favor then? <clears throat> and that's carried. Okay. Mr. Chairperson, from a practical manner, Sherry will send out invitation invites to the committee members for all of those meetings in the next week. So you'll get, I guess, three times uh, four meeting invites, just so you realize that you will have to, you know, if you want it in your calendar, you'll have to accept them all. <laughs> right. Um, financial orientation. Mr. Chairperson, this there's a lot to digest here um, with a number of new committee members. I thought it would be, uh, I haven't done a report like this for a committee previously. We've generally had a, a relatively stable uh, representation. And, but with uh, five new members, I thought it was uh, appropriate to provide background. I, I'm not going to, I am asking for something in this report, but the, the, what I'm asking for, if the committee's not comfortable with it, that doesn't make it or break it. It was just something I was asking for to be uh, to be dealt with. There's no reason it can't be dealt with at the next meeting if the committee's not comfortable. Uh, however, the rest of the report is really for background information. And um, it talks about where our revenues come from. We talked a little bit about community paramedicine. Um, so when 10 years ago, when I started here, there was one source of revenue and that was the Ministry of Health. And that's all there was. Uh, since that time, it has expanded and we have alternate uh, sources of revenue now, uh, mainly being the LIN funding I was talking about further uh, earlier, as well as the community paramedicine funding. funding. Uh, Matt's team has been successful in some uh, other small applications for funding for specific programs. And uh, they continue to try to find those as well. So the, uh, the revenues are 
relatively complicated with the 50-50 funding. Uh, and then we have 100% funding for First Nations and municipalities without organization. So when I speak about municipalities without organization, I speak about two primary areas. One we would generally call Argyle, for those of you who are familiar with that area, but Loring, Port Loring, Port Loring um, primarily, and those areas. And then the other would be the Brit area is also unorganized. So the province provides 100% funding for those. The funding formulas are complicated. And we're actually dealing with the ministry right now with regards to our unorganized municipalities. And what was interesting of note to me was that no service, EMS service that gets two more funding gets funded in the same ways for their unorganized areas. Every service, be that Sault Ste. Marie, be it Thunder Bay, Kenora, um, Cochrane, any of them, the TUMO funding flows differently to every single service. For us, we do it by households. That's beneficial to us in the sense that there's a great number, a large number of uh, cottages within our unorganized areas. So the province understands that they understand that we're maximizing that funding and they're, they're happy to provide that funding to us in that formula so that we can maximize that. When it uh, comes to uh, expenses, our primary expense is boots on the ground, paramedics on the road. So as we move through budgeting, uh, you know, it's pretty easy for everyone to understand that to save money means cutting services. To spend money means putting more boots on the ground. And that's really what it comes down to. Human resources are our primary cost. Uh, capital, we're um, uh, public sector accounting uh, practices compliant. So all capital and primarily we only have two sources or two areas of capital expenditures. That is uh, vehicles as well as equipment, primarily things like uh, in ambulance computers and defibrillators, there are other pieces of equipment, of course, but they're not as uh, nearly as expensive as those two particular items. That is all done through a depreciated system where the province provides 50% of those capital costs. However, they do it over five years or whatever the depreciated time frame of the piece of equipment is um, into the future. So Currently, if we have a 2018 ambulance, they will be providing us capital at one fifth because we, we, we replace them every five years in this budget. Um, that does create a complication for us in that that's a historical cost rather than a future cost. So by the time we go to buy a new ambulance in 2023 for that 2018 ambulance, costs have climbed yet the money the province is providing us with has not. So there is a lag when it comes to the capital expenditures. And this report does speak to that and talks about how we manage that with our reserve funds. Uh, what other highlights can I provide you here? I mean, that's, that's generally, um, where we're at, I'm happy to answer any questions. The 2023 land ambulance budget was provided for your information. I hope that you have seen this previously. It was provided to all the municipalities in October when it was uh, passed by town council. Um, however, if you haven't seen it, then you know, feel free to contact me privately if you would like as well, if you want a, um, a more in-depth discussion about it. But I'm happy to answer any general questions people may have with regards to uh, how we manage the money. Any questions? John? <clears throat> um, through the chair. Um, Dave, the, does the, or is the funding for municipalities of that organization likely to skew your unit, our utilization assessment? Like, is that, is that likely to be in effect given funding for a specific area, will that impact that study? Through you, Mr. Chairperson. So the unit hour utilization does not take into account uh, how or who pays anything. All it takes into account is the uh, wheels turning on the ambulance and when they turn. 
Um, obviously, there are areas in our district that when an ambulance rolls in that area, it's going to be on the road much longer. For instance, a call in the town of Perry Sound could be a half hour call. However, a call into uh, an island at the north end of Archipelago could be a four hour call. So the unit hour um, analysis takes that into account, but it doesn't take into account who's paying what for any of those sorts of things. So the time frame counts, not the fact of where it is or who's paying for it. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any. So, um, mover and seconder. Uh, Joel and Ann, <clears throat> that the EMS Advisory Committee supports staff recommendation uh, to have Perry Sound Council move a one third of the EMS Municipal Surplus Reserve Fund to the EMS Equipment and Capital Reserve Fund and to move one third of the EMS Municipal Surplus Reserve Fund to the Land Ambulance Severance Reserve Fund. John? Uh, Mr. Chair, we haven't really um, discussed the the how and the why, not the how, the why, the rationale behind the the moving of reserve funds. Could you just help us with the rationale behind the the strategy before we vote, please? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, th through you, Mr. Chairperson. So we have uh, the three the three reserve funds. And these are reserve funds, so they're managed by bylaw. They can't be utilized for any other service or any other uh, purpose. They can't be reallocated by town council or anything like that at all without the passage of a of a bylaw. So the three reserve funds, I just want to get to that section, are the equipment uh, capital reserve fund. So that reserve fund gets funded on an annual basis through the depreciation process. So each year, the, the operating budget flows money into that reserve fund. There is a land ambulance severance reserve fund. The intention of that is if the um, severance costs may be incurred if there was ever a change of employer for the medics. So the purpose of that reserve fund is that it would fund those severance costs if that were to occur. Since the inception of Perry Sound District uh, EMS, once it was amalgamated, which did take a couple of years, the West Perry Sound Health Center has always been the employer of the medics. Uh, that re particular reserve fund was initially set up upon the divestiture of the province of EMS with the thought that severance costs could be incurred in the future and there needed to be some money set aside for that. And it's something that we need to manage moving into the, uh, the future. Um, many services that were uh, operated the way we operate ours through a contract have moved to an in-house operation for the larger, larger areas, most recent uh, being Nipissing and Muskoka have both moved in that direction recently. Um, there are only two or three services, I believe, who do operate in the fashion that we do on a contract basis anymore. When EMS was initially taken over by the municipalities, it was much more common for services to be operated through a contract basis, through hospitals or other private entities. Then there's the EMS Municipal Surplus Reserve Fund. So when we have a surplus at the end of the year, that is where the money flows from that surplus. So this year we're expecting, you know, hundred to $200,000 surplus on the entire budget. Once the, um, the audited financial statements are provided, the province will take half of that surplus because in their minds, they provided half of it in the first place. So there will be a 50% clawback. And then the rest we flow into the surplus reserve fund. So what I'm doing here is I'm requesting that the uh, committee authorize me to go to town council to have some of these funds moved. 
we did an analysis in uh, 20, I think it was 2020 or 2021 through our HR department about the proper level, level that we should have the severance reserve fund at in case the service was ever moved in-house and severance costs were incurred. And to be properly funded, that should be near a million dollars if we were to cover severance costs, if that ever were to occur. Uh, additionally, when we take a look at the uh, equipment and capital reserve fund, that fund often needs to be supplemented for the fact that I mentioned earlier that the depreciated value does not account for what a new purchase would be. It's a historical cost that we get funded and ambulances have the, their value in the past two years has blown through the roof. And I'm sure any of you as municipal people will know if you purchase fire trucks, the exact same things has happened, it's happening with police cars. Any of these emergency vehicles, the prices are going through the roof. So we were funded at that at a 2018 value, we're still receiving in 2023. So that particular fund often needs to be supplemented to bring it up to a, a stable position. The other thing that happens is if we have new equipment, and an example would be when we converted to power cots in the ambulances, that was a new type of purchase. So it hadn't previously been funded through a depreciation process. So when things like that happen, then there is not enough money uh, through the budgeted depreciation process to fund those capital purchases. So in this sense, what I'm saying right now, and I talked to you about it with our finance department, it was we did an assessment of it, is that the surplus reserve fund is healthy. It's almost a million dollars right now. And we could afford to uh, supplement the reserve fund or the severance reserve fund to bring it closer to being fully funded, as well as to supplement the equipment capital reserve fund. So we simply did an assessment of what's a comfortable level for us to keep the surplus reserve fund at. And we felt that a third of its current value would be appropriate. And we could therefore move funds to the other two reserve funds. There's not a great deal of science behind it. Other than that, we're trying to manage those reserve funds so that they can be practically used in the future. Thank you. Does that help? Yep, thank you. <clears throat> okay, good. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments on that? Nope. All in favor then? Uh, it's carried. Thank you. Uh, any other business anyone has? No? John? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm not sure where, the, where this stands. There was some, some rumor pre-COVID, so probably two or three years ago, um, seemingly the, the province was beating the idea around uh, about um, amalgamating ambulance services, um, getting rid of smaller ones, making them into larger ones. Um, I don't know where it went. I think COVID probably stalled it or killed it. But I mean, the the, the severance uh, reserve fund um, sort of maybe sort of brought that back to mind. Has that, is there any rumor again about the province taking steps to amalgamate services? Not that I've heard. For you, Mr. Chairperson, you're quite right, and uh, John, in, in 20, uh, 2018, 2019, that was, <laughs> there was a move afoot to amalgamate dispatch centers as well as uh, EMS services into bigger entities. That completely fell off the rails in March of 2020, and uh, the province had much bigger things to worry about for two years. They have not resurrected any of those conversations in the, uh, since they've uh, stop dealing with the pandemic the way that they previously had. Uh, we are all keeping our ears to the ground to see if that does raise its head again, but uh, currently there has not been any um, push back in that direction to consider those amalgamations. They seem to have done their uh, some of the amalgamations or the uh, assessments of the regions in the south that they wanted to, and they've left it at that. They have uh, moved away from the the uh, emergency services branch of the Ministry of Health. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and and certainly through anything I'm involved with, we we haven't heard anything with regard to to that. So, 
hopefully it's off the table. Awesome. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Um, I guess then I need a mover and seconder for to adjourn. Joel and Anne. All in favor? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. I want